My name is Gregor Mali. I work at the National Institute of Chemistry in Ljubljana um, as a solid state NMR spectroscopist. Uh, this lecture will be, in a way, a step back uh, from what we were listening to just now. Uh, Professor Plavets has shown uh, many interesting results obtained with many uh, quite sophisticated uh, measurements in solutions. Um, I hope it won't be too redundant because this is a school after all. If I, uh, as I said, step back and uh, very quickly start from the fundamentals of NMR spectroscopy and then uh, devote most of this talk to elucidate let's say the difference between uh, solid state and liquid state NMR or the, 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 uh, the questions that are um, addressed in solid state NMR spectroscopy. And only at the very end, if there will be time, I will present an example of two of the application of solid state NMR spectroscopy. Okay, um, now uh, I, often like to say that uh, NMR spectroscopy is a method that exploits atomic nuclei as uh, tiny probes uh, that enable us to detect local fields. With local fields, I mean local magnetic and also electric fields in some cases. Uh, and by detecting these fields or being sensitive to these fields, uh, then NMR spectroscopy offers us an insight in the local structure and also dynamics as was just shown in the previous talk. Um, now, the, you probably already know, uh, but nevertheless, once again, if the nuclei are to be sensitive to magnetic fields, these nuclei have to have magnetic dipole moment. And uh, magnetic moment is a property of nuclei, all the nuclei that have um, spin that is non-zero, so that is not equal to zero. On the other hand, uh, nuclei, only nuclei that have spin larger than one half detect electric fields. Uh, such we call such. Oops. Uh, we call such nuclei quadrupolar nuclei. Um, they are non-spherical. Uh, as opposed to nuclei with spin one half, which are, which are spherical and don't have electric quadrupole moment. Uh, now, of course, the NMR is based on the principle or on the, the, the observation, which we all know very well, that uh, magnetic moments, all magnetic moments, also macroscopic magnetic moments in, let's say, like a compass needle, depend, uh, the, the, the energy of magnetic moments depends on the orientation with respect to the magnetic field. Uh, and then, of course, uh, magnetic moments or nuclei, which are oriented along the magnetic field, have low energy, and magnetic moments or nuclei, which are oriented in the opposite direction, have high energy. There are several ways to describe uh, um, what's going on in NMR. Uh, one is, of course, quantum mechanical description, which is uh, very complete and very long, but uh, here I will just focus on one. Uh, let's say, uh, uh, issue or uh, consequence of this uh, fact that if we don't have magnetic moments, then we have an ensemble of nuclei with different orientations, then all these differently oriented nuclei have equal energy. So the energy level for different magnetic moment or spin orientations are degenerate in the absence of magnetic field. When this ensemble is in magnetic field, then the degeneracy is lifted uh, for different magnetic quantum numbers. Uh, for example, here we have shown uh, levels for a spin three half uh, nuclei. So for different magnetic quantum numbers, we have different energies. And of course, also the occupation of these levels is different. The highest energy level is least occupied and the lowest energy level is the most occupied. What's important uh, and what we will mostly talk in the rem remaining of this lecture is that, of course, because these energies are different, there exists an energy splitting between the neighboring levels. And uh, basically the, the, the aim of NMR spectroscopy or 
uh, yeah, is to measure these energy differences very precisely or to measure transition frequencies which correspond to these energy frequencies very precisely. And the reason is in the fact that uh, because nuclei that are in different local environments uh, detect different energy splittings or different transition frequencies and therefore for different environments we detect different uh, signals at different positions in NMR spectra. Now, of course, if we want to be able to, uh, let's say, relate these uh, transition frequencies or, uh, with the local environment, we have to understand how local environment, how local fields affect these transition frequencies or how they affect energy level diagram. Uh, and because atomic nuclei are tiny objects, very, very small dimensions, we can describe the contributions of magnetic and electric fields to the energy of nuclei in such fields by so-called multiple expansion. So this means that we can um, do actually a Taylor series expansion uh, first, uh, uh, giving a monopole contribution, then dipole contribution, then quadrupole contribution. But as you will see, we, we don't need uh, that many contributions. Actually, we stop with the first important contributions for each of the magnetic or uh, the fields for magnetic and electric field. Now, in case of magnetic field, of course, because we don't have magnetic monopoles, we only have magnetic dipoles. Uh, the first important term is, of course, magnetic dipole term uh, energy. So, as already suggested. Um, can be expressed like this, like the dot project between the magnetic moment of a nucleus and local field at the position of nucleus. In, this is a classical expression. And if we, for a moment, turn to quantum mechanics, then we transform such an expression in such a way that we uh, transform the energy to Hamiltonian operator, magnetic moment vector to magnetic moment operator, magnetic field stays magnetic field. Magnetic moment can be related to spin, to nuclear spin, multiplied by gyromagnetic ratio, which is a property of a nucleus of a given isotope. And uh, if we decide that or select that magnet, uh, that um, laboratory Z axis will point along the direction of the magnetic field, then this expression transforms to this one. So we have a very simple. Um, operator form for a nucleus in a magnetic field. So proportional, this, uh, so this Hamiltonian operator is proportional to the Z component uh, of the spin. And we well know that uh, eigen energies of such an operator uh, are given by this, by magnetic quantum number, uh, general magnetic ratio. And what is important, of course, they depend on the magnetic field. So the energy splitting thus is therefore directly proportional to the magnetic field. And this is local magnetic field at the position of a nucleus. So um, this is important, local magnetic field. Now, what about electric field? Well, in case of this, we do have electric monopoles. These are electric charges, of course. So the first important term in the, uh, the first important contribution to the energy of a nucleus in electric field could be this, the monopole term, which is simply a product of a nuclear charge, total nuclear charge and the electric potential at the position of a nucleus. However, this term uh, is, does not depend on the magnetic quantum number of the uh, nuclear state, nuclear spin state. So this term shifts all the energy levels equally by equal amount, and therefore it does not affect the energy splitting. So either we have electric field or we don't have electric field, the energy splitting is the same. And so in NMR spectroscopy, we cannot detect electric potential at the position of a nucleus. So we have to go to the next term in the multiple expansion. The next term, of course, is the dipole term. We, of course, see that the form is the same as it was uh, the case with the magnetic field. So electric dipole moment multiplied by electric field at the potential of a nucleus. Uh, because electric field is, of course, uh, a gradient of electric potential. 
potential. But uh, this term is always equal to zero. It's equal to zero for two reasons. First, because electric dipole of nuclear of each nucleus is zero because nuclear, uh, let's say, center of mass is at the same position as nuclear uh, center of charge. So dipole moment is equal to zero. And also mostly nuclear reside uh, at the positions where electric field is zero. Otherwise there would be force acting on them and they would move, right? So in the equilibrium state, they uh, stay at this uh, uh, position with E equals zero. And this term is uh, zero then altogether. So we, to describe the energy of a nucleus in electric field, we need to go to the next term. This is the quadrupole term. And in quadrupole term, we have a product of uh, electric quadrupole moment of a nucleus and electric field gradient. So, uh, and uh, as I said before, uh, to for nuclei to have non-zero electric quadrupole moment, they need to have spin larger than one half. And this term, does affect differently levels with different quantum num uh, magnetic quantum numbers. So electric quadrupole interaction, as we call it, shifts some levels to higher frequency, some levels to lower frequency, and therefore it does affect uh, the transition frequency or the energy splitting. And therefore we can detect this contribution uh, by NMR spectroscopy, but we only detect it for uh, nuclear with spin larger than one half. So in summary, uh, the energy of um, nucleus uh, depends on magnetic dipole interaction and electric quadrupole interaction. Or in other words, nuclei can tell us something about electric field gradient, which depends on the charge distribution around uh, the nucleus. Uh, and they can tell us something about the local magnetic field, which is actually a contribution of several uh, sources or several other contrib different contributions. The most important and the largest is of course, the contribution of the superconducting magnet. So the external magnetic field, which we generate uh, by our uh, magnet, which is part of the spectrometer. But because we have put the sample into such strong magnetic field, then the response of one of the responses of the sample is that electrons in electron clouds around nuclei starts to uh, rotate, uh, start to travel around atomic nuclei. So they generate uh, weak electric currents, which uh, generate then uh, in turn, magnetic field, which weak magnetic field, which typically tries to shield the external magnetic field. So this green arrow represents uh, magnetic field because of the circulating electrons. We call this contribution chemical shielding because it tries to shield the external magnetic field, and because the magnitude of this field depends on chemical environment of uh, nucleus. Uh, but this is not the only contribution. Uh, of course, nucleus with this magnetic moment is surrounded by other nuclei which also have magnetic moment. And the fact that some particle has magnetic moment means that it's not only able to detect magnetic field, but it also generates a weak magnetic field. And this nucleus generates weak magnetic field with the arrow, with the blue arrow here at the position of the other nucleus. So these two nuclei feel each other. And this is the source of what we call dipolar, nuclear dipolar interaction. And of course, if nuclei with magnetic moments generate such magnetic fields, even larger magnetic fields are generated by unpaired electrons if they're present in our material. So because elect uh, unpaired electrons have three orders of magnitude larger magnetic moments than nuclei. So these are some of the uh, contributions to the local magnetic field. And um, now, of course, let, let's take a little bit closer look how these contributions affect the transition frequency. Uh, we will not have time to talk about uh, electric field gradients contributions. We'll focus just quickly on magnetic, different sources of magnetic field. But before we, we uh, more uh, thoroughly discuss these contributions, let me just uh, mentioned the magnitudes of these contributions, as I've already mentioned, 
uh, the largest contribution is the one of the superconducting magnet, which is in the transition frequency units on the order of hundreds of megahertz. Then paramagnetic ions or unpaired electrons can produce quite uh, large um, additions or <laughs> subtractions to these uh, energy splittings, which can reach up to 10 megahertz or so, or even more uh, if uh, the unpaired electron and the nucleus are really close one to another. So this can be, if we have a paramagnetic sample, this can be a very strong, uh, let's say, perturbation or very strong effect seen in the uh, spectrum. Uh, also, um, electric field gradients give rise to strong corrections of the transition frequencies. Uh, on the other hand, chemical shielding and uh, contribution of neighboring nuclear magnetic moments are weaker, uh, but uh, nevertheless, they're uh, typically the most important in uh, the measurements, especially if we're talking about uh, diamagnetic materials, and these two contributions are the, the most important. Um, now, for the external magnetic field, okay, we know very well how they affect the transition frequency, of course, through the, this magnetic field. Uh, we have transition frequency, which we call our uh, Larmor frequency, and this Larmor frequency, as you probably know and heard already, uh, depends so on the magnitude of the external magnetic field and on the general magnetic ratio of the nuclei under observation. Uh, now, nuclei, different nuclei, different isotopes have different Larmor frequencies. Uh, in a magnetic field of 14.1 Tesla, this is magnetic field of our spectrometer for solid state NMR measurements. For example, Larmor frequency of protons is 600 megahertz of carbons is four times lower of oxygen 17, even lower for nitrogen 15, 10 times lower. So this uh, can uh, be very different. And this uh, different Larmor frequencies affect a lot how easily or with what difficulties we will measure some NMR spectra. Uh, now, if it was only, if nuclei only detected the external magnetic field and no other contributions, then a spectrum of a molecule like this alanine molecule, as an example, would look like this. We would detect one signal belonging to protons, one signal belonging to carbons, even though we have uh, different carbons on different sites, if they only detected external magnetic field, would have one signal here and so on. Uh, but as I've mentioned just a minute ago, we also have other contributions to, to this uh, energy splitting or this, this transition frequency. And therefore, uh, okay, we will start with the first contribution, which is chemical shielding contribution. Now, uh, this is the, the, the uh, let's say, effect of chemical shielding on the transition frequency. So it has two terms. The first one is called the isotropic term, and the second one is called the anisotropic term. Uh, anisotropic means that it depends on the orientation, uh, that it's not equal uh, for if uh, molecules are differently oriented. We'll talk about a little bit later. Let's first focus on this part. Or for both parts, actually, we see that both terms are proportional to the Larmor frequency. This means that both are proportional to the external magnetic field, which in turn means that if the nuclei are not in the external magnetic field, then there is no chemical shielding contribution. There is no chemical shift. So that's why it is very important that in NMR we use um, magnetic field. And the stronger magnetic field we use, the stronger will be effect of chemical shielding. Uh, the second part or the second uh, Parameter uh, in the, uh, this first isotropic term is the so-called the isotropic uh, uh, sh chemical shielding uh, parameter uh, or isotropic shift. Um, it is important uh, to know that this parameter is different for nuclei in different environments. So this means that nuclei, for example, in the alanine molecule, uh, carbon nuclei, for carbon nuclei in this alanine molecule, will have different value of sigma iso for the methyl carbon, different for this middle carbon, different for the carboxylic carbon. 
So uh, if it was only this contribution, in addition to the LARM or to the external magnetic field, then the spectrum of carbon nuclei for such a molecule would look something like this. So we would have three narrow where resolved signals belonging to three different types of carbon atoms or carbon nuclei. And this is pretty much what we typically detect in solution NMR spectroscopy. But I've mentioned that that we actually do have another part that contributes uh, to the uh, chemical shielding and uh, that this part depends on the orientation of the molecule or the crystallite or the crystal fragment or yeah, uh, particle uh, with respect to magnetic field. It de uh, depends on this orientation through these two angles. And the magnitude of this uh, also depends uh, on two other parameters, which are again, uh, let's say, uh, which will again differ for nuclei in different environments. So for methyl carbon, this will parameter, which is called anisotropy of chemical shielding, will be different from this parameter for carboxyl uh, carbon. And also this asymmetry parameter will be different for different sites. So if this, uh, orientation, uh, if this um, yeah, orientation dependent part uh, is present, uh, it's always present also in solutions in principle, because in every instant in solution, we also have molecules that are oriented in different directions. But in solutions, these molecules move very quickly. They rotate all the time with very, uh, on a time scale that is much shorter than are the NMR, typical NMR time scales. And this means that on the NMR time scales in solutions, this part is averaged out due to orientation of molecules. But of course, this is not the case in solids. In solids, we have rigid uh, crystallites which are oriented in different directions and therefore molecules in differently oriented crystallites will give different, will have different contributions to chemical shielding because of this anisotropic part. And this means that, for example, if we take a look at uh, carboxylic signal of one molecule oriented like this, uh, it will not give rise to a signal here where it was shown before, but because of this additional contribution, it will resonate here. For a slightly differently oriented molecule, we will have uh, another signal nearby, and for different orientation, again, another signal nearby. And because in NMR, we typically need quite a large number of uh, quite yeah large number of nuclei or quite a large amount of sample. We typically work with powder samples of the volumes of several microliters or several ten, tens of microliters, which means that in such volume we don't have uh, only one, two, three particles, but we have many particles, and therefore we have a good distribution or of orientations over all angles theta between 0 and 180 degrees and phi between 0 and 36 degrees. And so we, instead of getting some, uh, let's say, individual signals, we actually get a spread and distributed signal very broad and we call such distributed line a powder pattern. So for, for a single site in a molecule in our, uh, in a crystal fragment, in a powdered sample, we get a powder pattern. And the position and shape of the powder pattern depend on the isotropic value of chemical shielding tensor, on the asymmetry parameter of chemical shielding, and uh, uh, this is uh, anisotropy of chemical shielding and the asymmetry parameter of chemical shielding. And this is, of course, true for all, ops, for all the sites in a molecule. For example, here in alanine molecule, all three carbon, this, chemically distinct carbon atoms uh, or nuclei would contribute its own uh, or their own powder pattern. And this, this in a way, this is nice and this could be a strength and to some extent it is a strength of solid state NMR because in principle it does offer us additional insight into the structure of materials because we're not only able to determine the isotropic parameter but we are in principle able to determine also two other parameters for each nuclear species. However, as soon as we have more sites, then 
more powder patterns will overlap and soon this will become a mess. And even if we have a simple molecule like or simple crystalline substance like alanine, we still will have a problem. And the reason is that chemical shielding, as mentioned before, is not the only additional contribution. We also have contribution of neighboring nuclei. So if a nucleus has in proximity another nucleus with the magnetic moment, then its transition frequency is affected in this way. So it's again orientation dependent. Here theta ij is an angle between the vector connecting these two nuclei and the external magnetic field. And uh, again, um, having a powder in which we have distribution of these angles with respect to external magnetic field will lead to a powder pattern because of this uh, anastropic uh, nature of the dipolar coupling, which we call this interaction. Uh, now, this is again, in a way, a positive thing, because if we have an ensemble of such uh, spin pairs um, in our sample and we detect such a powder pattern, then by analyzing such a powder pattern, we can determine uh, what is uh, called the dipolar coupling constant. So this is actually an anastropic parameter, which is directly proportional to the distance between two nuclei. So by analyzing such a powder pattern, we could uh, measure distances between neighboring nuclei. But this works, again, we, there is a but, this works only if we have uh, relatively isolated pairs of nuclei. So we have such a pair of nuclei here and then uh, far uh, away again such a pair and then far away again such a pair. But in practice, one nucleus is typically surrounded by several other nuclei. There is one nucleus here again and one here, and one here and so on. And these other nuclei have slightly different distances to slightly different dipolar couplings. They have different uh, orientations with respect to the, these vectors are, are differently oriented with respect to external magnetic field. All this will lead to the fact that uh, this powder pattern will smear and will typically smear into a Gaussian type of line. And of course, we will get such powder patterns, Gaussian type of powder patterns, when we sum up all contributions for all three sites, for example, in alanine crystalline. crystalline. Okay, uh, so now I've shown that we have two sources of broadening, which in principle contain some useful information, but will be difficult to, de to detect. One is chemical shielding, one is dipolar coupling or contribution of neighboring nuclei. If nucleus is of quadrupolar nature, then there's a third source of uh, broadening, which is due to electric quadrupole uh, field uh, uh, term or due to electric field gradients. Carbon nuclei, which I'm showing here, are spin one half nuclei, so there is no such contributions. Nevertheless, when we sum up all these, um, those two um, parts uh, together, so the chemical shift anisotropy and dipolar coupling, uh, and measure uh, experimental spectrum of alanine, we get such, such a let's say, overlapped, uh, shapeless uh, spectrum, which indeed should, uh, should uh, contain a lot of information, but this information cannot be extracted out of such a spectrum. Um, now, we've heard just in previous talk by Professor Plavitz that in solutions where we do not see these anisotropic interactions and anisotropic broadenings, we still can learn a lot, a lot about the structure of molecules uh, from NMR. So having uh, this uh, anisotropic uh, broadening in the spectra is not necessarily a good thing, or even if we can remove it, we will be able to use NMR uh, very efficiently. So can we somehow remove this anisotropic broadenings from the solid state NMR spectra? Well, we can try and mimic fast reorientation of molecules in solutions so that we 
spin uh, solid samples very quickly. Uh, what's the effect of such spinning? Well, if we take a look at, for example, uh, the case of this dipolar coupling contribution. So let's say that we select a rotation axis, so the axis around which the sample will rotate. And then in, a, in one crystalline, for example, these two nuclei are oriented so that this vector points in this direction. And when we will, we will quickly rotate the sample, so this vector will travel along this uh, circle very quickly. And in another crystallite, in which the two uh, nuclei were differently oriented, in which their uh, vector connecting them was differently oriented, this vector will again circulate very quickly around this rotation axis. Um, and if this rotation will be very quick, then on the NMR time scale, uh, this nucleus will see an effectively averaged picture, which is that for, for both type or all types of uh, nuclei, I mean, for all orientations, for all crystallites, this nucleus will see as if this other neighboring nucleus was sitting on the rotation axis. So, so as there was, uh, so as the, uh, the dipolar coupling in this averaged way would depend only on the orientation of the rotation axis with respect to external magnetic field and not on the orientation of this um, individual uh, axis in different uh, crystallites. So for all particles, for all crystallites, we get such a time average picture and now if we're, if we're clever and select this angle in such a way that this term in the parenthesis is equal to zero, then we can completely remove this part that broadens our spectrum. And we can do this so that the, the proper angle is uh, 54.7 degrees. We call it a magic angle because it has such beneficial effects because it removes the contribution of this neighboring nuclei, so the contribution of dipolar coupling. It also removes the broadening due to chemical shielding uh, anisotropy, but it of course leaves the isotropic contribution of chemical shielding, so the chemical shift. So what do we get for the um, spectrum of crystalline? Uh, okay, before I show you what is the effect of this, of uh, such rotation, which we call magic angle spinning. Um, yeah, let me tell you that uh, because of these beneficial effects of magic angle spinning, this is nowadays practically the uh, present in almost all experiments on solids, or at least uh, for those who study materials and organic solids and pharmaceuticals and so on. Perhaps in basic physical NMR measurements, basic physics, a magic angle spinning is not yet that present, but in all other areas of solid state NMR, magic angle spinning is typically the, the basis of all experiments, which are then upgraded with some other approaches. Now, how do we do? Uh, how do we, uh, with what equipment we can do uh, such magic angle spinning? We need a special NMR probe, uh, which contains a part which we call a stator. In this part, we then insert uh, such kind of um, ceramic tube, typically is this zirconium oxide tube, into which we put the sample. So we have to very finely uh, pack the sample inside this tube, which we call NMR rotor. Then we close this tube by cap and by a turbine from one side. And then we blow air, nitrogen, other gases to this turbine, and this causes the rotors to rotate. And we can rotate rotors with very uh, large frequencies. Um, typically, we use from a few kilohertz to, in our lab, to up to 40 kilohertz. But uh, in general, uh, nowadays, also special probes are available where uh, spinning can be as fast as 150 kilohertz. Um, okay, now what happens to the NMR spectrum of uh, crystalline alanine if we start spinning the sample? Well, if we start spinning it very slowly, 
then actually we don't immediately obtain only three narrow signals, but we obtain basically three sets of signals. Here is one set, there's another set, and there's another set. If we uh, take a close look, we see that this difference between uh, signals in each individual set is equal to rotation frequency. So when we rotate faster, for example, we displace these signals and we rotate even faster, we further displace these signals. Uh, these are, uh, let's say, sets of signals are called uh, spinning sideband patterns. And this contain the sharp signals at the isotropic position, at the isotropic chemical shift, but also carry some information about the anisotropic interactions, which we've talked about before. So chemical shielding anisotropy and chemical shielding asymmetry parameter. But if we still increase the uh, rotation frequency, when the rotation frequency becomes larger than the broadening of the static line, then we practically can remove all the spinning sidebands, so all these additional signals. And at the end, we remain with just the, the narrow signals that belong to different chemical uh, carbons on different chemical environments. In this particular case that I'm showing, we still see uh, weak uh, spinning sidebands. Uh, this was done with rotation at 20 kilohertz. So if we would still increase the sample rotation, we would um, remove even these sidebands. Okay. Um, now, um, so I've already mentioned that uh, magic angle spinning is a very valuable uh, basis for most of solid state NMR measurements. Uh, but this is only the beginning. Uh, there are other issues which we need to tackle uh, for efficient uh, analysis of solids. Uh, if we're dealing with quadrupolar nuclei, uh, we still sometimes have to deal with uh, or have to try to improve resolution uh, of signals which are broadened by electric quadrupolar interaction because this is, interaction is so strong uh, typically, magic angle spinning is not uh, enough to completely remove the quadrupolar broadening. Sometimes uh, this is good because we can analyze the line shape and then extract um, quadrupolar parameters out. But sometimes the overlap is too strong and then we need to design sequences, the design experiments where we additionally remove this broadening. But then when we have a well-resolved signal, of course, this is only the beginning. And then uh, we would like to get back some information on these anisotropic interactions. One thing I've already shown in the previous slide, uh, we can learn something about chemical shielding anisotropy by rotating sl more slowly and then still analyze the spinning sidebands and extract these parameters out. But even more useful information is usually the information on internuclear distances, which depends on dipolar coupling constants. So we need to design, and of course, during the last few decades, efficient uh, experimental approaches were designed, how to, in the presence of magic angle spinning, which averages out uh, this dipolar coupling, how in the presence of this spinning, we still can, when we want, reintroduce this dipolar coupling. We do this by some synchronized uh, pulse sequences where we synchronously uh, irradiate uh, atomic nuclei and for, for uh, let's say, selected time, um, uh, take care that the dipolar coupling is not destroyed. Uh, of course, there are two uh, more general issues uh, of NMR, but are also present in uh, solid state NMR, perhaps even to a larger extent in solid state NMR than in liquids, because in liquids, uh, most of the studies is still done on protons, carbons, nitrogen. In solids, when we study materials, we face many different isotopes, not only lithium, aluminium, sodium, phosphorus, fluorine, and so on, but also nuclei like magnesium, potassium, 
and calcium. So, and some of these nuclei have very small magnetic moments and perhaps some isotopes are very rare in nature, have low natural abundance, and then it is very difficult to measure spectra of such nuclei. And so one of the big issues of NMR and of solid state NMR in particular is how to enhance the signal of such difficult isotopes. Or perhaps if we have, if you're interested, for example, on what is going on on the surfaces of the particles. So this is uh, the surface is a small, small part of the sample. And then this means that we are talking about the low number of nuclei that are interesting for our studies. So we need techniques to enhance the signals. And this, uh, there is a lot of effort in this area in the last few years by dynamic nuclear polarization techniques. Uh, and finally, what um, we would also like to improve the state of the, uh, especially material sciences, to be able to run uh, in situ measurements uh, because um, um, it's always uh, you, you can always uh, learn many interesting things if you monitor what's going on with your sample, what's going what's going on in the during the process. But NMR is limited to a large to uh, to a place with large magnetic field to a small size inside the magnet so this is also a difficult issue i guess i'm uh, running out of time yeah so i will not um, talk about examples i will um, stop here and uh, be very glad if there are some questions that i can answer so thank you for your attention